Welcome to Aging Insight with your host, John Ross and Lisa Schollmeyer. This program is made possible by to another edition of Aging Insight. I'm your host, John Ross, here with my partner and co-host, Lisa Schollmeyer. And we are elder law attorneys right here in your neighborhood. And we come on this show to address the kind of issues that people uh, have as they get older, the, the kind of things that they're concerned about. Maybe answer some of those questions that you've had lingering out there, or maybe even identify some issues that you didn't even know existed. But you know, what we do know is that people have concerns. They don't want to go to nursing homes. They don't, they don't want to become a burden on their friends and family. And they, they don't want to go broke trying to pay for their care. They want this to be a smooth transition. You know, they, they, they call these the golden years. And, and if it's the golden years, then it should be, should be fun and easy and nice. And, and we know that, that that is actually possible. Your golden years can be golden, but there, there's a lot of ways it can go wrong. And if you arm yourself with the kind of knowledge that we provide right here, you can make it on your own terms the way you want. Now, our topic for today is retirement accounts. Uh, and in fact, our topic today is the hidden dangers of retirement accounts. You know, most people, when they think about retirement accounts, they think about these things are great. Well, usually they think, I don't have enough in there. <laughs> well, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's the first thing they think. But, you know, John, we're fortunate that in our community, you know, we live in a community that has a number of employers, uh, such as uh, that are in manufacturing or healthcare, that offer their employees uh, 401k uh, retirement plans or, uh, you know, or guidance and contributions to employees and their IRAs or individual retirement accounts. And these type of retirement plans are just critical to our community members as they get into retirement and, and think about retiring someday. So, you know, our topic today really might concern some of our younger viewing audience as they look a little closer at these retirement accounts and avoiding these dangers. Um, but you know, John, when you go to work for an employer that has a retirement plan, you know, usually the paperwork involved with signing up for that oh, retirement yeah. plan, you know, it's offered to you when you're doing all of your employment paperwork. And you know, a lot of times retiring is not the first thing on your mind, you're trying to, you know, you're starting this new job, you're getting the paperwork done, you're going through your orientation. And so a lot of times that HR person is, is putting, you know, scores of papers in front of you, sign here, check here, you'll need to designate a beneficiary here, you know, we're going to issue you safety equipment, sign here that you're going to be responsible. You know, so there's a lot going on. So oftentimes that retirement agreement document you know, there's just not a lot of thought given to it on that front end when that employment is accepted. Right, there's not a lot of, uh, of, of, uh, of attention paid to the details. The big picture, people get. You know, I'm gonna take some of my income and I'm gonna contribute it to my retirement account. They're gonna take uh, the money directly before it ever gets paid to me and it's gonna go into my retirement account where it grows tax-free and maybe my employer even takes some of their money and matches what I contribute. And over time, it's gonna grow and it's gonna get bigger. And when I eventually retire, I'm gonna be able to get this money out. That's the big picture. But as, as we say on here so often, details are important because what happens while you're alive with this account, what happens when you die with this account those can be some big issues. So, you know, the first thing is kind of like you were talking about, Lisa, they're sticking these papers in front of you. And 
when you sign up for this account, one of the first things they're going to ask you is, who gets it when you die? That's right. They ask to designate a beneficiary. Well, you know, and a lot of times we designate a spouse uh, and then there, there might be a line on the form to ask, you know, who a contingent beneficiary would be. You know, if your first beneficiary is also deceased, who is the next person you would want to have whatever's left in your account? Um, you know, and one thing I have discovered about these forms is they don't give you a lot of room on the form. <laughs> So, you know, a lot of times uh, there's just one or two lines listed available to list beneficiaries and a lot of employees who aren't familiar with these forms feel like they are limited to just the space that is on the form. So I guess one of my first pointers would be, you know, these are personal decisions that really aren't limited by the space on the beneficiary designation form. Yeah, so, no, that's, that's absolutely right. Uh, you know, it's not uncommon in our practice where we're trying to match up those beneficiary forms with the other planning that we have done. And oftentimes we will prepare statements. Um, it, it, I've had them be several pages long that, that become the new beneficiary designation as an attachment to that form. So yeah, you're not limited by the form. However, sometimes you can be limited by the law. Well, that is true enough. You know, um, uh, for instance, with 401k accounts, uh, these are very common retirement accounts offered by employers. And the law is going to dictate a lot of what your beneficiary designations can be. And, you know, I think we'll take a break and we'll talk about the pitfalls of the conflict between the law and a beneficiary designation. So stick with us, we'll be right back. All our moments should be cherished. SEMA Hospice provides comfort care when you need it most with compassion, dignity, and respect. Along with Jordan Health Services, SEMA Hospice provides compassionate continuity of care. SEMA Hospice, comfort and care when it matters most. As things get older, they require more care. This car and I have seen a lot of miles together, but because I take care of her, she runs just like she did in 1955. That's why I chose the Wadley Senior Clinic with an individualized care plan designed just for me and a convenient location off Jefferson Avenue. They have everything to keep me running like new. It's not about the miles, it's about the journey. Let the Wadley Senior Clinic keep you happy, healthy, and cruising down the road of life. Hi there, I'm Larry Sims. It's been my privilege for the past several years to be a volunteer board member of Hospice of Texarkana. And there I'm able to represent community members like you. We continually customize our end-of-life care to better meet the needs of our community. As an example, our medical director and nurse practitioner still make visits to homes and facilities. Call today to learn more about the help we can give your family. Hospice of Texarkana, the nonprofit hospice established in 1985 for the community by the community. Hi, I'm John Ross, elder law attorney and board member for the Alzheimer's Alliance, and welcome to Our Place. Our Place is a day program designed to provide rest and relief for the caregivers of people with Alzheimer's and related dementias. Our Place is a safe environment where our friends benefit from socialization in a home-like environment. Alzheimer's is devastating and affects over 17,000 families in our area. To find out how Our Place can benefit you, please visit our website. From our first moments to our final days, life's journey should be remembered free of burden and worry. Family should be cherished. SEMA Hospice provides comfort, care, dignity, and respect. Learn more about SEMA Hospice at SEMAHospice.com. SEMA Hospice, comfort and care when it matters most. Welcome back to Aging Insight. I'm Lisa Schollmeyer, and I'm here with John Ross. And today we're talking about some of the hidden dangers or pitfalls in retirement accounts. And you know, specifically, I wanted to bring up that there is a conflict between what the law says you can do and what you can actually write on a beneficiary designation form when it comes to a 401k account. So, 
Let's imagine that uh, you are a single man and you go to work for an employer and you list your three children as beneficiaries on your 401k. And you know, these kids could be minors, they might be grown, but, but regardless, the employee himself is single for some reason. Well, let's say that employee gets married. Now, the employee may have consciously thought, hey, I'm not gonna change anything about my 401k because I want my kids to get it if something happens to me anyway. So maybe they even consciously decide that the beneficiary designation works and they don't need to change it. But if that employee, after they marry, if they die, the new spouse under the federal law that governs retirement plans, the new spouse will receive 100% of that 401k plan balance. Yeah, which is certainly not what the, uh, what the guy intended. Right, you know, and, and this exact situation happened to a gentleman in, down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and uh, his new spouse of just six weeks got the entire balance of his 401k because there was a conflict with the law says a 401k must be paid to the spouse unless, and here's the trick and the pitfall I want you to watch out for. If you want that 401k to go to someone besides your spouse, your spouse must sign a notarized and acknowledged waiver of their rights in that 401k account. Right. And, and this, can be a, uh, this can be a tricky thing to do. And, and it's one of those things where, uh, you know, those beneficiary designations can jump because, you know, the beauty of life is that it changes. Right. And you might not be married to the person who you had named that on that form. And it's not, uh, in fact, there was a, recently a big Supreme Court case where somebody had named a spouse as a beneficiary divorced that spouse, remarried, and then did not change the beneficiary designation from the first spouse to the second, died, and the benefits were actually paid to the first spouse because they were still the named beneficiary. So there can be lots of different things. It depends on the type of account, whether it's a traditional IRA, a 401k, a SEP, a SIMPLE, or any of these other thousands of different types of accounts. They all have their own rules and it can be pretty confusing out here. And there's always the possibility of unintended consequences. You know, you might be sitting there thinking, well, you know, John, Lisa, uh, I mean, I get all of that, but I've already got everything payable to my spouse. It's all fine and dandy. Why would I ever want to change that? If my spouse is alive when I die, I want everything to go to her, right? That makes perfect yeah. sense. Except that think about what happens when the two of y'all are both 85 years old and that spouse has Alzheimer's and cannot care for themselves and you're the caregiver and then you die. And now you've got those assets paid to a spouse who cannot manage her own affairs or his own affairs, might need some sort of government assistance to help pay for nursing home care or in-home care and by naming that spouse as the beneficiary, you've just disqualified them for, from all kinds of things. You might have even created other heartaches like having you know, somebody having to get a guardianship in order to deal with those funds. Yeah. So, you know, in, in this situation, the bottom line is, you know, because life changes all the time, the, the designations that you make for your retirement should also change over time. You know, if, if you're a younger person with a spouse, you know, if there's a change in your marital circumstances, you need to call your HR department and get that beneficiary designation form for your uh, retirement plan and take a look at it and make sure that it's, that it's what you want. Also, if you are a younger employee with a retirement account, you wanna make sure and adjust that account anytime you add to your family. You know, I've seen situations where a younger employee has left uh, the retirement account to the spouse, and then that contingent beneficiary was that son that was born to them. Mm -hmm. Well, later on, they may have a daughter 
but the employee never goes back and adds the daughter as a contingent beneficiary on that account. So if the parents are in a common accident and they perish, well now the entire account is only going to go to that son. Right. And the daughter is left completely out in the cold and no assets. And obviously that is not what the employee intended, but because they didn't keep up with the changes with their family circumstances and make those changes on their retirement account designations, uh, they have an unintended consequence, a definite pitfall. Right, and, and maybe, uh, maybe you're the parent of this young employee. Maybe it's your son or daughter who's just gotten this great job and they're, they're not married, they don't have any kids, they're, they're just out of college and they've started this new job, but they do have this retirement account. And oftentimes I have seen where those, those young folks, not knowing who to name, they just didn't name anybody. Right. And, and, and then unfortunately, bad stuff can happen. And we have seen situations where that young worker uh, it dies in a car wreck or something like that and the family has to jump through a tremendous amount of hoops in order to get access to those funds and figure out you know do they go to the parents do they go to the brothers and sisters and they typically have to go through the court system which can be quite expensive in, in many cases so uh, you know if you're that uh, older wiser generation out there you know pass this same information on to that younger worker and tell them, hey, look, even if you don't have any kids or, or a spouse, you do have this asset and you need to figure out who it's going to go to because it'll save everybody a lot of time and effort. Yeah. Well, John, and something else I've heard from a client sitting in my office is, you know, when I've asked them about what the status is of their retirement accounts and the designations that they've made, uh, you know, they may tell me something uh, that an ex-spouse or someone is listed, but yet they're not worried about it because, number one, a friend told them mm -hmm. that an ex cannot inherit any property. Um, and number two, they'll say, well, you know, in my divorce decree, it says that my retirement is all mine. Right. And, uh, you know, these are, you know, these are two, uh, these are two points of state law that are, there's a shade of truth in them, certainly, for many other assets except for retirement accounts. Right, because most of those retirement accounts are gonna be governed by federal law. And, and the, way our, the way our legal system works is if there is a conflict between what the state law says and what the federal law says, the federal law wins every single time. And so, yeah, lots of people have heard something about that state law, but not realizing how some other law out there steps in and trumps it. So as you can see, there's lots of little issues all of, with all of this. And of course, all of this is just related to those naming of beneficiaries when you die. But you know, those same accounts can cause problems while you're still alive. We're gonna talk about that when we come back from our next break. So stick around and we'll keep talking about the pitfalls of IRAs and retirement accounts. Be right back. Off of McKnight Road in Texarkana, Texas, the Oaks Independent are apartments for seniors who love secure peace of mind and consistency in their lives. You're going to fall in love with this newly built luxurious residential establishment for the aging adult. All bills are included and all apartments are wheelchair accessible, inclusive with all the amenities. Live in style, comfort, and accessibility. Live independent. Call today to schedule a tour. The Oaks Independent. With my dad, it was, it was in a hospital setting. Um, and in his situation, he fell into renal failure. He also helped us make the decision to be on hospice. I have to admit, it took a, a huge weight off our shoulders for him to be willing. That offered us a lot of comfort, along with the hospice company itself, but it, it gave us closure and it helped us through the entire process. SEMA Hospice, comfort and care when it matters most. Hi there, I'm Larry Sims. It's been my privilege for the past several years 
to be a volunteer board member of Hospice of Texarkana. And there I'm able to represent community members like you. We continually customize our end-of-life care to better meet the needs of our community. As an example, our medical director and nurse practitioner still make visits to homes and facilities. Call today to learn more about the help we can give your family. Hospice of Texarkana, the nonprofit hospice established in 1985 for the community, by the community. Welcome back to Aging Insight. I'm Lisa Schollmeyer here with John Ross, and today we're talking about the pitfalls and dangers of dealing with retirement accounts. You know, our previous two segments of the show today have really been about beneficiary designations and making sure you account for changes in your family circumstances and you make sure that your beneficiary designations are the way that you want them and that you understand how the law applies to those designations. But like John said before the break, all that has to do with who gets your accounts at the time of your death. But you know what, these accounts uh, are something that are accumulated during your lifetime. And so while you're living, these are assets that you may have to deal with and you need to be careful because there can be some pitfalls uh, even while you're living. Now, John, most of these accounts are a way to sock away some money mm -hmm. and have that money grow in a tax-free environment. You That's know, right. If that money, if that if that money is earning interest and dividends, you're not paying taxes on it as you go. No, right. You you either got a tax deduction when you put it in, or you never paid tax dollars on the money because it came straight from your employer, and and it has since gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, all without any tax consequences, because when you start drawing it out at some point in time that's when you're going to pay tax on it. Yeah, and, and of course the idea here is while you're an active worker that you'll, you're in a larger tax bracket and it's good to have these you know, tax-free growth or the tax deductions for making those contributions. And you know, most of us, our income typically goes down a bit in retirement. Mm -hmm. And so when we start accessing these accounts in our retirement years, you know, the hope, frankly, is that the tax rates are a bit lower on us individually. That's right. And of course, you can, um, anytime before age 59 and a half, if you touch any of the dollars in that 401k or IRA, you're gonna pay a penalty. After age 59 and a half, you can start withdrawing that money without a penalty, but you still have to pay taxes on it. And of course, when you reach age 70 and a half, you have to start drawing money out of it. What's called a required minimum distribution which is an amount you have to take out of that IRA so that it starts becoming taxable. Well, that's all fine and dandy, but what if you need to, to get a lot of that money out for some particular reason? That could create a gigantic tax bill at some point. And a lot of times people don't think about the fact that these things are very inflexible when it comes to how they interact with the rest of your estate planning. You know, so for example, let's say that I, let's, what if I told you that, that I could create a trust that you're still in control of your own assets, you can still benefit from those assets, but if at some point in time in the future you needed to go to the nursing home, the value of those assets would not count towards your eligibility for something like Medicaid to pay for that nursing home. In other words, you could have your assets, be in control of your assets, and not have to worry about losing them if you go to a nursing home. You might say, well, John, that sounds like a terrific idea. And, and for many people, that type of vehicle is a great tool. But so many times I've talked to folks and I've said, you know what, this is a great tool and we could use it to protect your house and your land and your CDs at the bank and we can protect anything with this type of trust, but you can't transfer an IRA into it or a 401k into it, not without creating a tax problem because those accounts have to be owned by that person in that person's name. 
That's right. So, you know, a lot of times uh, these accounts, uh, that's where a lot of folks wealth is located as they come into their retirement years is they've hopefully uh, maybe they've been real conscientious savers into those retirement accounts and so now you know they have a home they have some some free cash and cds but the bulk of their estate is located in an ira um, and you know we cannot make trust beneficiaries of that ira we cannot make distributions out of that IRA as gifts to our children or grandchildren um, without taking the money out of the IRA, paying the taxes connected with those funds, and then doing something with the funds. That's right. So a lot of times if you have those kind of accounts, again, if you're looking forward down the road, depending on what other assets and stuff you have, it may actually be more beneficial to start taking money out of that IRA type account, paying a little bit of tax on it, but getting it into a what's called a non-qualified investment. In other words, one that's not governed under all of these restrictive IRS rules so that either now or at some point in time in the future, you'll have more flexibility to be able to protect those assets because you know, in many cases, it might be better to pay a little tax now than have to spend every penny of it later. Well, you know, and John, and that's hard for a lot of folks because they're so conditioned not to touch the IRA. Mm -hmm. um, and their CPAs are conditioned to tell them not to touch the IRA. But, you know, this is, you know, as you get into retirement, it's appropriate to really have a checkup and check in and get some good advice about some some planning options that you might have that's right and of course where do you get good advice well lots of different places but one of them right here on aging insight and and if we haven't answered your question you still have questions out there one of the things you can always do is call in to our live radio talk show aging insight it's on 107.1 every saturday at noon and you can call in ask your question and get an answer right that very second. So we've enjoyed having you with us today and we would encourage you to check those beneficiary designations on your uh, retirement accounts and give some thought to uh, creating some additional flexibility in your estate plan in the future. So uh, stick with us and be back here next week for another edition of Aging Insight. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for this week's Aging Insight program with John Ross and Lisa Schollmeyer. This program is made possible by 